So just wanted to touch on um, one of these things, which is big numbers. Um, so there have been historical problems with effective measurement of comms activity before. Um, and I think that's just because communications has changed so much over the last decade, it's virtually unrecognizable. Um, of course, the traditional skills do still remain, but the remit of communications has now di diversified to cover a whole host of channels, um, which we need to measure effectively. But despite this, the C-suite execs still remain skeptical of the ability to deliver um, objective bottom line measurement. So, we think that that's due to partly an image hangover, but also down to the lack of kind of a best practice approach, uh, which is why we at Conscious Communications have spent a lot of time refining our methods um, so we can have a really effective approach to this. Um, usually the method for measuring um, data and different activities, it fits into the finance shape tick boxes um, and they want to generate one thing, which are these big numbers. Another word um, for that are vanity metrics. And, you know, we like big numbers too, but what does that actually mean? Who does that represent? What are these people going to do after they've absorbed whichever activity we're talking about? And what are they going to do next? That's what we're really interested in answering the questions to. So if we think about some of the methods that have been used historically, and it's not to say that they're not um, valid. We just think that some of them are a bit overly simplistic when we think about them now and all of the different things we've got at our disposal. So, for example, in terms of marketing, if you if you were just thinking about an output focus, you could look at something and say, we spent our time do and budget doing X number of X. And that's great for tracking activity, but without combining it with an outcome focus, it actually doesn't give us any information. Um, similarly, if there's lack of context, so if we're thinking about an email campaign, we're all used to receiving the reports that would say uh, this campaign generated a 3% click through rate, for example, but that number doesn't on, on its own doesn't actually tell us anything without the context. So is that larger or smaller than last year? Is it bigger or higher or lower than our competitors, for example? So we really need to put it in context to make it um, insight that can really help out our impact. Um, and then I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with the dreaded AVE when we think about PR and earned media coverage. Um, so the practice of identifying how much a piece of earned media coverage would cost if it was booked in um, as advertising, then assigning that value to the piece of coverage. And then PR value takes that one step forward. So taking that large total figure, we we're just talking about those big, big numbers. This is where PR value comes in. And it usually multiplies it by a normative figure like three or five to create an even larger number. Um, and that accounts for additional credibility and therefore higher value. So as I said, these are methods that have been used and that's not to say that they've not been useful, but without the context and without the meaning behind it and the insight, we don't think it's actually um, adding any value for us when we're measuring our impact. So where do we go from here? So we've been talking about big numbers and data. Uh, we've got so many data sources available to us now, um, especially with online media, digital, modern CRM, making um, prospective customer and consumer behavior highly trackable. Um, but it can lead to data source overflow. And this is just, this is a list of some of the data sources available. It's not uh, conclusive, but I'm sure many of you will be familiar with them from search to social media, web conversion, sales pipeline, brand recognition surveys. There's a whole host of them and actually Google Analytics alone can give us um, 200 separate metrics. So where do you even start to navigate through that? Um, so we really need to make sure that when we're looking at our data, it's linked to our business objectives, our marketing strategy, so we can actually glean that insight that actually makes sense as we move forward and make changes in our marketing plans. So using all of that kind of background, uh, we need to think about our approaches to measurement. And of course there are different ways and I'm sure people will be doing them in different ways. 
already and it definitely depends on whether you're a bigger company or a smaller company and how much budget and resource you can allow for measurement but we really want to encourage people to adopt a different mindset by focusing on data um, and thinking about measurement in a different way so this picture might look a bit random but it will become clear in a second um, so we want to move beyond just the data and the numbers and really deliver the insight on what that means so the core principles that we that we adopt at conscious communications are threefold um, and we want to make sure that measurement isn't just the justification of our activities it's to gain active insights i know i keep saying that word insight but it's so important uh, which can then be used to inform the planning um, of our strategies moving forwards Importantly, we take a balanced approach to the data because there is so much out there. We need to knowledgeably and creatively interpret it to build a clear picture of that impact um, and avoid survivorship bias, which is what this pic picture is linked to. So we want to give equal weighting to the activities which are successful as well as the, the activities which aren't successful. So we, we always need to grow and improve with everything that we're doing for our clients and for us as a business. Um, and just as a side note, this picture is really interesting um, because it kind of displays survivorship bias. So during World War II, um, a statistician um, took survivorship bias into his calculations when considering how to minimize the bomber losses to enemy fire. So he wanted to recommend adding armor to the aircraft that had returned to missions in the areas that showed the least amount of damage, so in the white areas there. But actually that contradicted the US military's conclusions that the most hit areas needed additional armor. But though it just shows that the ones that were most hit do not survive. So that's just how to incorporate survivorship bias. I know that's a bit of a side note, but I thought it was quite an interesting way to think about it. Um, so I'm sure I've zoomed through that as I normally do, but I'm gonna hand over to Ali because she's gonna start talking you through uh, the practical stages and the process that we use at Conscious Communications. Thank you, yes. So. What, once we kind of have an understanding of the landscape and kind of thinking about data and thinking about how we might want to approach it, I think as Zoe said at the beginning, what we really are wanting to talk about is just your approach to measurement rather than giving you specific instructions of, oh, you know, you need to be using this metric, this metric, this metric, because it will be different for all of you which are on the call because you obviously all have very different businesses and very different landscapes. So, Talking about the approach, we have broken it down into a stage process. Um, so, sort of quite simplistic, but we'll just take you through each one. Um, to build a measurement strategy which values data, you need to build an effective picture of your performance and of the audience that you're talking to. Um, so you need to understand who your target audiences are first and foremost because then you need to figure out what is going to be most effective when you are reaching them. Um, so you can build a picture of them in using a variety of different methods, but you can use their demographics, for example, their age, their gender, their location, these are kind of the basics. And then you can develop more of your psychographics, so for example, what type of people are they? What motivates them? What opportunities do you have to influence them? What challenges are there when you're trying to talk to them? What are your competitors saying to them? You know, who do your competitors think that they are versus who you think that they are? Um, and once you get a clear picture of who your audience is, that's when you can start to gain that understanding of what it is that will work for them and what it is that you need to measure. Um, so that's stage one, is to start by building that picture. And it, oh sorry, hang on, I'm having a little bit of an issue with my, yeah, there we go. I, I can't see the screen very well. Um, so you have a variety of assets at your disposal to help you create that picture. So first and foremost, you have your own data. You understand who your customer are, you understand what their touch points are, you know where you are interacting with them. Um, and if you don't have very much of that, for example, if you're just starting out, 
then you can get customer insight data and state of the market reports from a variety of different sources. So we um, use a industry um, industry tool called eConsultancy. I'm sorry, um, anybody who's worked in marketing is familiar with it. They're one of the big sort of players in terms of data and insight and things like that. But they, if you have a subscription, then you can access a wealth of information about consumer behavior, the way people are interacting with different types of marketing, what's, what's effective in different regions, what's better and what's worse, for example. Um, and then also for your sort of FMCG consumer products, you have things like Nielsen Data, Ipsos Mori, um, for the more B2B side, Trade Body and Ombudsman reports can be really useful. Um, buy behavior and trust indexes as well can show you, for example, enable you to predict how the market might be shifting. Um, which helps you to round out this picture that you're painting. This picture is a paintbrush because we call it paint by numbers, basically. Look at the data and look at the numbers and then start to paint a more colourful picture than what they are telling you. Um, media coverage as well, obviously, for PR com communications, be all and end all. You can look and see what type of coverage you're getting, um, what your competitors are getting, what sort of titles they're in, where you want to be, look and see, you know, for example, who your board think are influ influential versus who you, your sort of lower stakeholders might think are influential and map it out like that. Um, social media listening can be really useful um, in terms of giving you real time sort of a real time snapshot of what people are saying about a different brand or an industry. Um, obviously, social media usage, I don't know if anybody was in our Conscious Comms webinar the other week, but social media usage at the moment is through the roof. So you never know, you might be able to go on there and see what people are saying about your industry that might give you a slightly different perspective from what you believe at the moment. And then there's also as well, old school practice of conducting small scale and large scale focus groups. And you can do this with a variety of partners, we run them quite a lot, just you know, getting a few different uh, community groups together, for example, if we've got a local client. And it's just, I don't think I've ever run one where I haven't come out of it having learned something slightly different than what I went in expecting. So it's always a really good practice to do. Um, if, if you haven't ever considered one before, it's worth thinking about potentially what you might be able to take out of it and what you could use it for. So yeah, you, you, just, you just need to develop this picture and then add the color on using as much research as you can as well as your own data. Um, so once you know who they are, once you have painted this picture of your audience and what it is that they look like and, and the types of ways that they behave and what they might be saying about people within your industry, then you need to understand what they are doing when they come into contact with you. I, we, we sort of go into when we um, work with new clients, for example, the, the key thing that we always try and get our hands on is a really clear picture and an understanding of who their customer is and where they come into contact with them. And it, it's surprising how often it's not really prioritized or considered in terms of marketing and communications efforts, because people don't necessarily look at their existing customer base and where they come through to them. They just focus on how they're going to get the new people through the door, so to speak. But understanding what brought your existing base into you already is gonna be one of the primary drivers for building your strategy for what it is that you think is effective in terms of your communications efforts. So what are the influential factors? What are motivations and what are the levers that are bringing people in? What pushes them through to decide to purchase? If you really interrogate that process and identify what your tipping points are, you ask questions like, how much time does your ideal customer spend on your website before making a purchase? What, how long are they reading our case studies for? If our case studies take the average person 10 minutes to read and the length of time people spend on our web website is three minutes, do we need to have a think about what we're doing with our content here? Um, how many emails on average do we have to send a customer before they turn up on our website? How many events do we have to throw in order to get our conversion rate goal? And just looking back really um, and really interrogating what has happened to bring you to the place that you are, identifying which parts of it you want to replicate and which parts you want to streamline will be the best thing to start you off on the right foot in terms of effective measurement because it will give you the map of where it is you want to 
really know and understand what is happening and measure the effectiveness. And it will also give you indication of what isn't serving your goals in terms of measurement and what you're wasting time on. Yeah. Um, so once you have this clear picture of your audience and you know what they're doing and they interact with your next step, what you can then do in terms of your communications activity is start to prioritize based on your objectives. We use a really simple framework and, um, called Awareness Affinity Action. I'm sure it's not new to anybody, but just to kind of spell it out. So awareness is obviously all of the awareness raising sort of activities where you just want people to start building up that brand recognition and building up that brand um, you know, awareness, which is so important because at the end of the day, you're not going to convince a customer to take an action if they've never heard of you. And that brand building is really, really important. We sort of, as much as sometimes it is painful and to fight for it inside an organization, you have to really champion the awareness raising parts of your marketing effort because not every objective can be all conversion all the time. You all end up basically just, you know, sort of in that spam area, which everybody is a consumer. And you know when you're being spammed and you know how you feel as a consumer. So it's important to take that head and think about it when you're planning your kind of objectives and your marketing efforts. Um, affinity is that crucial understanding phase where you are getting to know your customer and they are getting to know you. They are getting to understand what it is that you stand for, what it is that they can expect from you, you know, how they can rely on you and what sort of is your brand equity and everything that that means. You have enough, that's I think the longest phase, if, if everybody remembers the, the funnel, the marketing funnel, the understanding section is the biggest, is the longest part before you push somebody over the line. But there's so much you can do in terms of content and measurement for that affinity page, which tells you what's working and what's not. Um, there's really, you have to go through it in order to get to where you want to be, which is necessary, the action. And then obviously, finally, action, people are actually making the purchase or signing up to the event or downloading what, you know, the, the case study or handing over their data, et cetera, et cetera, whatever it is that you want people to actually do and convert. And by building a framework, um, um, if we go on to the next slide, um, oh. I appear to have skipped through. Okay. What you can do, <laughs> we'll go on to the prioritizing notes, okay, we'll just leave it with this. Um, the best and most effective thing to do once you have prioritized your action, um, and if then you need to understand where you are, so you need to benchmark. Um, you know who your audience are, you understand how to reach them. Um, you then need to look at what you are doing and how it's performing in comparison to your competitors and also in comparison to your own self. You can benchmark against your own performance, so you have access to a wealth of your own data about how many emails you've sent, what the results were of them, and then you can look at what you want to do for the next year by identifying what was effective and what wasn't, um, and keeping a tr track of that. But you can also access general benchmarks for different industries from a number of different sources. So for example, digital marketing, um, e-consultancy has really good benchmark data. They have social media conversion rates, social media click-through rates, uh, reach, et cetera. Same for email marketing. You can find that on there in different regions and different countries um, and, and, and in different industries as well. It's broken down by how much you can expect to spend um, and how effective running a campaign might be. Email marketing, it will give you, if you go on Campaign Monitor or MailChimp in their blog section and in their resources section, it will give you a general benchmark for what you can expect your open rate to be, your click-through rate to be, and then you can track your own performance against that number. Um, social media, Spark Social is a great resource. They have really good um, information on their blog and on their website, which shows you for example, best times to post, you can get a general um, engagement rate, reach rate, uh, click-through rate example for different organic and paid for social activity. And then you can see how yours is performing in comparison. SEO, obviously Moz gives you the gradings, which is really useful and you can track how, um, how well your, your website is performing in search function. 
Um, it's only by benchmarking that you can identify what's working and what's not working and what it is that you want to replicate and what it is that you want to maybe remove. Um, benchmarking will eventually enable you to provide that context that we, Zoe was talking about at the beginning. So you say if we take that example of that we, this email campaign achieved a 3% click-through rate, by benchmarking, that enables you to expand that sentence. And when you're reporting, which we'll talk about slightly towards the end, um, you can say, this email campaign achieved a 3% click-through rate, but our last email campaign only achieved 0.5. So in comparison to ourselves, we are clearly being more effective with our email marketing in terms of our targeting and our content. Um, and it's in the provision of that context that you can draw out those conclusions. Without it, it just is 3% of, of anything, you know, the, the number doesn't mean anything on its own. You have to interpret it for the people and um, who you're presenting it to and give them, a, give them the direction for the conclusion that you want them to draw. Okay. Um, so a couple of example things that you could include in your benchmarking. So the volume of coverage you've achieved year on year is a big one, obviously. Um, for, PR, um, for PR and communications, if you're looking at earned media, dwell time on your website as well, really interrogating that, what people are doing when they get there, how long they're spending, it's matching up your content, you know, for if, if, if your dwell, average dwell time is only a couple of minutes and everything that you have on there takes the average person 15 minutes to read, then you need to rejig what you're doing and think about your customer experience and what they're coming there to do and what it's working for you. Balance rate is another big one because that will give you an indication of the quality of the people um, that are coming in, you know, if they meant to end up there or if your advertising is going out and bringing people in who've got no intention of ever doing anything. Um, but the, it, it, it can be really anything. I think you have to go away with the tools and interrogate your own process and, and think about what, what benchmarks will give you the information that you want for your business. But this is just some examples of things that you could look at. I think, sorry to jump in, Ali, I think importantly, I guess for startup companies, obviously they won't have anything to benchmark against other than the kind of um, numbers that you said were available via those other outlets. But it's still important to take that benchmark, even if you say, Okay, 23rd of June, we were at zero followers on Instagram, for example. It's really important to make a note of that date so you can then look back six months down the line and you can track the different engagement rates, uh, the follower growth and things like that. So even if you're just starting out, it's still really important to do that. Yeah, definitely. And I think with just slight sideline on social media, I said we weren't necessarily going to give, give you go away and do the things exactly to measure but just in case it's, it's helpful for anybody the main thing with organic social for me i think is is the is the follower growth rate so if you go from zero to 50 50 is not a huge number in terms of social media for example you might be looking at some of the influencers that are out there some of the big accounts and you know they're up there 7 million 50 000 etc and that might be where you want to be but by going and finding out what the average organic growth rate is for a company of your industry on the social media channel that you're on, it will give you a clear picture of whether or not you are actually reaching the people who want to engage with you or not. Because if your growth rate is really low, it means that you're not working with the organic social media algorithm to bring people in who then want to follow and connect with you. You're just sort of putting content out into the universe, which isn't landing directly where you want it to. So don't necessarily look at the number, like Zoe said, the big numbers and, and focus so much on them. Focus on what they are telling you with the growth rate and, and, and different elements of that number and how you've got there and what it is that caused it. Because that's what's going to give you the information to then take away and inform your strategy. Sorry, sideline. <laughs> Um, so next stage of the process, um, if you're thinking about awareness affinity action as your kind of framework for developing your communications objectives, then what you can do is match and tag your organization's objectives with your communications objectives. So for example, your, um, your board of directors or your senior leadership team 
over to you and say, okay, so our objective for the next quarter is we need to increase revenue by X percentage. If you have gone through the previous stages in the process and you have interrogated what it is that brings your customers in, what it is that causes them to you know, understand your business and what it is that causes them to make a purchase decision, then you know what the different things are you need to do in order to help reach that objective, which allows you to set your communications objectives. So in order to get to your increased revenue, you know you need to increase awareness by X and you can do that by doing you know, this many social media campaigns, this much PR, this, this many events, etc. Um, and, you know, you just have to mirror what the organization wants to achieve and translate it into an actual communications objective, which then, in a, which you then have the tools to measure. So you can go back and report more effectively on what it is they have asked you to, 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 to achieve, essentially. You can demonstrate your role in reaching that objective. Um, so things like we want to become a world leader or a household name in X industry, you know that in order to in order for them to reach that goal, you know what that looks like in terms of um, building that customer affinity. Um, if, for example, you are working, trying to counteract maybe negative perceptions, historical negative perceptions, you're working against a challenging sort of environment, then you can undertake some activities which are also affinity based, but around changing perceptions, breaking taboos, increasing that understanding. If, if, if the people at the awareness edge of your funnel might have a slightly negative perception of you, then you know your communications objective. In order to achieve the organization objective of counteracting that negative perception, you need to do these affinity activities. And by assigning metrics to your affinity activities, you'll be able to go and accurately report back on how that is, how that is changing and how that is working. Um, so one way to do that is building in this framework, you then go and tag your activity. So for example, you know you want to do this amount of awareness raising and you yourself know what works for you in terms of an awareness raising activity, but these are just some examples. Um, you know what is there in terms of affinity, so that might be your longer pieces, case studies, thought leadership pieces, etc. Organic social, digital content, your action, email marketing, paid social, surveys and sampling, for example, um, if you want to get people through to conversion. So it's, it's a case of looking at, looking at um, what it is you want to do and plan in order to achieve the objectives which your organization has set you and going and tagging them effectively and deciding what is achieving what objective and therefore tracking them to see how they are performing against what the desired goal is. So um, then you need to identify the right met metrics which are going to give you that knowledge and that insight. Setting the right objective helps make sense of the masses of data that we have available, but it should also tell you which metrics you need to track and which ones you can ignore. So like Zoe said, with the 200 different types of metrics which are available on Google Analytics, which ones are actually telling you what you need to know? When you're choosing your metrics, it's important to be selective. So consider data sources outside of your own remit. You know, it, it, if you can, as difficult as it can be in many organizations, try and, and, and reach across into different silos, for example, into the sales team, into the finance team, um, and plan how you might be able to access some of their data to inform your own metrics of what you're measuring, um, and have your kind of attribution modeling set up, for example, so you know which touch points are telling you what, who they're coming into, and what data you have at your fingertips. Um, metrics employed will depend on the activity and availability of the data that you have. So if you are use, if you're doing digital marketing, for example, then you have things like Google Analytics, social media analytics, um, which will provide you with direct metrics. Um, but if you're doing other different sort of slightly, uh, you know, face-to-face, -face, for example, communications activities and media coverage, PR activity, events, you need to develop your own set of metrics, which you, which you can build based on what it is you want to understand, based on your organization objectives and your communications objectives. So tracking it all the way backwards. 
um, metrics for public relations activity, it's important to measure the quality of the message delivery that you're putting out there rather than, you know, those big numbers again, we got 10,000 pieces of coverage, well done us, but all of them just, you know, all of them said our name one time. Mm. Not helping you build anything um, towards the final goal. So identifying what is delivering the quality for you and building your own metrics based on that is what is going to give you the most insight. Um, it's important to measure what is useful, not just what is easy. Getting your hands on some big numbers is obviously very easy <laughs> if you want to, but it's that attitude and that approach of making sure that you are prioritizing and championing the data that's giving you the understanding and also telling you what isn't working just as well as what is. Um, it's a bit of a seismic shift to try and champion on your own, especially if you have a, a board, for example, who just wants to see this is a big number, this is how well we're doing. But there's ways that, that you can manage it in terms of your reporting, which we'll go through. But just some examples of different metrics. Um, for example, so he, this is a really basic overview, but you kind of have your communications activity on the side, some digital marketing, etc., some some face-to-face, -face, some PR, um, what the objective was for that activity, and then potential metrics which you can pull together for each of them. Um, obviously, traffic, bounce rate, click-through rate, etc. Um, but by going through and cherry-picking what it is, is going to give you the most insight and tell you what it is that you need to know, you will be better served when you come to reporting, um, which is where I'm going to hand back over to Zoe, who can take you through a bit of that. Yeah. Um, so I think, as Ali said, when it comes to reporting, you kind of need to keep in mind who you're talking to. So whether you're de delivering your quarterly report or your annual report to your stakeholders or your board, you obviously know how they respond to different information. But actually, the human brain isn't wired to understand vast spreadsheets. So we like to call ourselves data storytellers. So we want to use the data to tell a story um, and add that context as well. So it's easily understandable. It can link back to the business objectives. Like Ali said, it's all tracking through. It all has to track through. Otherwise, you're going to be questioned about why you're spending X amount of time or X amount of budget doing a specific communications activity when it's actually not delivering any impact. And that's what your measurement might show. So you need to keep in mind who you're talking to, have a key headline, um, add some context so it's easily un understandable, but also make sure that that data is actionable. So as we've said, we'll, we look at the activities that are successful as much as those that are unsuccessful. So if we need to make a change to our activities or wh where we're directing our efforts, that's what we'll, we'll do. But, you know, that's what the reader needs to understand. They need to have that data insight, which has informed our decision to change our activities. Um, and obviously you can use nice charts to visualize that, but again, that's not what we're wired to see. We want to hear the story behind it, the rationale as to why we're gonna continue our social media campaign, or we're gonna use more money for another advertising campaign later in the year because it worked well and it drove um, visitors to our website which led to conversion so you need to kind of tell that whole story to make sure that un everyone understands where your position has come through. Um, I think I mentioned before we obviously appreciate that some companies have more time resource budget resource to invest in measurement it is time consuming uh, which is why we've you know we've invested a lot of time at our end to come up with an approach that works for us and works for our clients and it gives us a great um, narrative to then be able to move forward with our program. So you've got to do what works for you, but do you remember that if you, if you continue doing what you've always done, then you'll always get what you've always got. So um, it's all about, we wanted to kind of shift the mindset a little bit and delve into the data and measurement and metrics that are available to you. So you can start to build that story um, using the data and make any changes that you identify, which will hopefully um, impact your activities and your bottom line. 
Um, so I think we've got one question which we'll get to you in uh, a second and any more that come through as well. Um, I just wanted to touch on quickly um, something we like to call CC insight and as I said we've been spending a lot of time thinking about measurement over the last year or so that we've actually developed our own system to create um, a measurement tool for us to use because we found that the, the different approaches that I mentioned before, like AVE, PR value outputs, it just doesn't give anything that we can actually use moving forwards for us, for our work, for our clients. So we've created our own tool. So it's very data centric, but it allows us to tell a story and it focuses on the framework that Ali took you through, which is the awareness, affinity and action. It's all tailored to the different clients' objectives, their audiences, which we paint the picture of. Um, and we have it in different packages and things like that. So if anyone does have any questions about that or wants any more information, our email addresses are there. But also do feel, um, do feel free to contact us with any other questions if you want to soundboard anything or if we don't get to any questions on here, do feel free to drop us an email. So um, let's see. So there's a question from Jack that says, what are your thoughts on comparing social media analytics like impressions and engagements? We've been tracking these monthly. However, the number seems to depend on so many variables. For example, time of day, topic of tweet, month, that comparing is almost redundant. Well, this is interesting. So not to repeat um, ourselves, but it, it, it depends on what it is that you're trying to achieve with your social media. So if you're doing that brand building and you want to grow your audience and you want to um, just grow your presence on there so that people have greater brand recognition for you, um, the thing that I think is most important for that, if you're doing organic only social media, um, is engagement because um, an impression is essentially, so if, if, if me a person sees something that I like and want to interact with, Zoe, who I'm friends with on Facebook, she'll see that I've liked it. Somebody who's friends with Zoe might see that they've seen that I've liked it, and then it will go on to A another, and they will count that A another as an impression, because yes, it has made an impact on that person, but the one that you really want to know about as the business owner is me the one who engaged with it, the one who thought, yes, that speaks to me on, on, on a level that I, you know, I want to continue my, I want to continue seeing that, I want to hear more from them. So by optimizing for engagement, um, then if you just focus on that and have a look and, and, and identify what it is that the topics are that are driving that engagement, what time of day is best for you to drive that, what, you know, what, what time of the month, etc. Um, and compare it with your own self. So month by month, this is what engagement looks like for us. If we post with a blue headline, then it's up by 10%. If we do it without any pictures, then it's down by 20. It then gives you the tools with which to replicate for your objective. Um, so I think there's so much data science which you can apply to social media because you can get so many metrics out of it if you want to and the impressions are always the big number um, and they really count for example if you are doing paid for social media advertising so if you are trying to get people to directly convert or you're trying to get people to click to buy using some of the shopping functions etc then your impression rate to your conversion rate and what the drop-off is is the information which is going to tell you something interesting about your customer. So 10,000 people, you know, our advert made an impression on them and they were thinking about maybe buying something from us, but in the end, a thousand people did. And how do we change that? How do we increase it? How do we, um, you know, make it grow that number? And what is it that we need to do with our advertising in order to achieve that? But so it, it, it's really objective dependent, but I think, if once you understand what your objective is, what you're trying to do with those channels, it will then give you a clear route for what the most important metric is for you. Um, and by prioritizing that and that alone, not all the time necessarily, it's good to have the other numbers as well, because at some point you might want to look back at them because you might be trying to find out different information. But what you're prioritizing 
um, uh, you know, for, for a set time period is dependent on what you're trying to achieve. Okay, thank you. Um, and Richard has asked, how were the results from your own webinar on June 9th? Which is a really good question. So our colleagues, Alison and Sophie did a webinar um, communicating your way out of lockdown a couple of weeks ago. Um, and they, I think they maybe had about 80 people on their webinar for that one. And actually it was really valuable for us. It kind of reignited some conversations with people we'd not spoken to in a long time, which was great. And also introduced us to some new people and companies to start some conversations. So for us, it was incredibly valuable and we hope everyone who took part found it valuable as well. But for us, it was a success. Um, Richard's also asked, how valuable are the stats from Google and LinkedIn? Ah, okay. Um, so, uh, very different, if you like. Um, I'm assuming Google, you mean sort of SEO, so how you're appearing in search, etc. Um, Google uh, is, is obviously the, the biggest beast in the world and is always making changes to its algorithm and search engine optimization and where it is that you're appearing and what it is that you have to do in order to appear. Okay. Oh, Google Analytics, sorry, forgive me. <laughs> okay, Google Analytics, this is where you can find out what your website is doing for you. So if, if you have a customer base and you, you know, you, you know how, how many people are coming onto your website, what they're doing when they get there, how they're engaging with the content, for example, dwell time will tell you how long they're spending reading your stuff, bounce rate will tell you how many people are coming onto your website and just finding nothing which is of interest for them there and therefore disappearing. You can look at the location specifics, for example, so say you're thinking about having a, a, a pop-up event or, or running a satellite event or attending a trade show in, in a location where you don't normally operate business, you can have a look at your Google Analytics and it will tell you whether or not you have an interested customer base there. Um, and it just, it, it, it's valuable because it will help you paint that picture of your audience and help you understand how in its current format your potential customers and your stakeholders are engaging with your website. Um, you can take that to be very, um, very analytical for your own self and your own sort of um, communications activities and what content that you're putting out on your website. Or you can apply it, for example, to your marketing and communications activity. So you, by um, looking and interrogating your referral traffic, um, you can do things like trackable links, Bitly, there's tools which enable, uh, which enable you to do that. Um, you can look and see where people are coming in from, what time of day they're coming in. Um, but if you want to maybe have a think about what your content is doing for you, how, you know, whether or not it's representing you in the best way, maybe it's what it's telling your customer um, what they need to know, then you can look at you know, how they move around your site, where they spend the most time, what they spend the most time doing. If you have a um, conversion function on your website, so for example, a, a, a payment provider where people can go through payment details in, you can, you should be able to track using the data from the payment provider and comparing it with Google Analytics. If there is a journey that your customers usually take before they end up at the payment. And then once you understand that journey, you can look to optimize the content that they come interact with. So for example, if people come onto your homepage, they go and have a look at your products, they go and have a look at your case studies. Most of the, the most popular case study is the one where you have an example of how your product might work in a certain setting. That's what sends the most people through to convert. Then you know that that's your most engaged customer base and you can focus your marketing efforts accordingly. So by tracking that, it gives you the tools to define your strategy. LinkedIn is, is slightly different um, because it's a social media, um, social media channel um, and it has less of the functions in terms of the direct shopping and the conversion. Um, it, it, and obviously it's more B2B as well. But it should give you that insight into that brand building side um, that we were talking about before. So who it is that's connecting with you. Connect LinkedIn is very much a personal platform. Yeah not allowed to engage obviously as a, as a company. 
um, unless uh, you are a person who's the face of the company, for example, but just as a flat company page, you can't go out and do any engagement driving um, capability. But as a single person, then you can really help with that brand building and that brand equity by driving that engagement. So looking at seeing what it is that people are most likely to engage with and then replicating it um, is a good thing to track and will help you inform where you might spend your time and effort and potentially your budget in the future. Yeah. I think just to add to that, Ali, with Google Analytics, like we said, there's over 200 metrics that you can potentially look at but it is really worth investing your time kind of interrogating what it can offer you because it can all link back so for example if you placed or achieved a piece of coverage um, on some online media and it includes a link back to your website we would call that a commerciality link then you'd be able to track that in google analytics as well so you can see you know you can see how well your pr efforts are doing your social media your organic social media versus your paid social media there's a whole host of things that you can track if you're doing a specific ad campaign you can create specific events on google analytics so it, it is very clever but it's quite robust and it does take time to weave your way around it and make it work for you but it, i think it's well worth it for sure um so we've got a last question maybe sarah quickly um, are the data privacy regulations causing a detrimental effect on analytics from platforms? Yes, <laughs> in a word. Um, so uh, kind of having a, a, a death to cookies moment um, and, and what you used to be able to do basically with third party data um, on Google and with social media advertising is basically make hay. You could get all of the data that you have about a person and their online behavior and use it to target them to absolute death, basically. Mm -hmm. The cookie functions, if you're doing um, PPC, if you're doing sort of Google ads, et cetera, and you can also do the same thing on social media. Um, what is now happening is people are sort of realizing how much data they're giving away um, and it, they're clamping down on it pretty effectively. So, it, what um, what is happening in terms of the shift is now the platforms essentially don't want you to come off of a platform in order to give more data up. So a, a very simplistic example is if you are trying to sell something using social media, the Facebook, uh, the Facebook family, so Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger, you know, biggest uh, social media provider out there, they are now um, introducing the function so you can go and make that purchase directly within the platform without having to leave to go onto a third party website. Because when you leave to go onto the third party website and put your financial information in, so put your credit card number in there, for example, and make your purchase, they used to be able to get that data. And what's happening is the privacy regulations now mean they aren't allowed it anymore. Um, so, everybody's pivoted fairly quickly to try and stop people from leaving different channels in order to make purchases. And it's probably going to keep happening at quite an extensive rate. So depending on what it is that you used to track um, and the data that you used to be able to get your hands on and how, and how much you would rely on it in order to inform potentially your advertising or your um, marketing effort, it's if you're using sort of third party um, private financial data that's getting clamped down on really quickly so potentially it's time to have a look and see what other metrics you might want to employ which are going to give you some insight where you can't use that anymore um but i think it's it's definitely going in that direction it's not going to stop quickly gdpr i think was just the start yeah, so absolutely. be very nimble Okay. Lovely. Thank you. Thanks so much, ladies, for your time and for taking us through your frameworks there. I really appreciate that. Um, thanks to everyone as well for joining in and being patient with us as we got sorted at the beginning. Yeah. Glad we got that straightened out. Um, so there are really interesting questions there actually as well. Some things that um, have come across my mind. So thank you for asking those. We'll share around the presentation so you can catch up on some of the bits there as there was quite a lot of helpful information I think on your slides so we'll uh, share that round with the presentation um, and yeah hopefully talk to you all soon so I'm going to close the meeting there and say goodbye thank, thank you, you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. <laughs> thank you Donna <laughs>